All right, then I will call this task force meeting to order and ask Katie if she will do a roll call, please. For sure. Uh, Kimberly Kirby. Here. Thank you. Leslie Chambers. Present. Thank you. We have Catherine. Um, Lieutenant Kyle Hanna. Here. Ramona Harris. Here. Thank you. Francis Abbott. Um, okay, we have Francis. Um, Shannon Derman. Uh, Sunny Funk. Good afternoon, present. Thank you. Uh, Kristen Raby. Present. Thank you. Rutha Chatwood. Okay, I see you in the chat. Uh, Morgan Lamondre. Here. Thank you. Rachel Mayu. Here. Uh, Mariah Wineski. Here. Uh, Sandra Starr reached out to let me know she couldn't make it. I am here. Dolphinette Martin. Okay. Uh, Tiffany Simpson. Here. Thank you. Uh, Remy Starnes. Payton. I'm present. Yes, we have a quorum. Great. Um, well, welcome everyone. I hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving um, and thank you for joining us. Uh, and I think um, the first order of business is for us to get uh, a, a motion on the last minutes, um, so the last meeting's um, minutes. And um, I believe Katie circulated those minutes before. So do we have any motions to um, adopt those minutes? Well, I guess first let's hear, are there, are there any um, questions or concerns or revisions for those minutes? Hearing none, I will ask if there are any motions regarding those minutes. Anyone, anyone wanna to move to adopt them? I move we adopt the minutes. Thank you. Do I hear a second? I second it. All right. I think that that motion then passes. We've adopted the minutes from last um, last month's meeting. Thank you so much. So today, um, I would like to thank. Uh, we have our own Sunny Funk, who, um, as most of you I think will know, is executive assistant, a district attorney out of Jefferson Parish. And Sunny has agreed to talk with us today about um, basically the role a prosecutor can play or should play or um, uh, will play in issues relating to screening and um, review of cases involving survivors, uh, criminalized survivors of intimate partner violence. So I will actually, instead of going into it, I will just ask Sunny, thank you, first of all, Sunny, so much for agreeing to do this. And do you need to have uh, Katie allow you to screen share? Yes, please. I put together a very quick, um, just a PowerPoint presentation um, to help, you know, kind of guide us through through all of this. Um, let me see if I am any good at screen sharing. Okay. One minute. Uh, all right, time out. Uh, let me get back to the screen. You think we would be pros at this by now, but. It never works smoothly. And despite <laughs> doing this for nearly two oh, years, I still yeah, fumble with it every yeah, single yeah. time. Don't feel bad. <laughs> it's horrible. I hate it. Um, all right. Can y'all see that? Probably not. Um, no. I don't think so. It. No, I'm not seeing it. All right, hang on. Oh, one moment. Okay, let me attempt to screen share again. Uh, 
Okay, let me go from beginning to see if this works. Can you all see that? Yes, we can. Now we can okay. see the whole screen if you want to go to the from beginning. Yeah, I do. I just got to figure out how to get there. Hang on, you. <laughs> The one all the this way on the left. Go go all the way on the left. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That um, should. Oh. Did that work? Yep. 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 That worked. Okay. Good. Thanks, y'all, for helping me walk through this. Um, as you can see, uh, technology is not my thing. Um, but I will take a minute to introduce myself to those on the committee who don't know me. Um, my name is Sunny Funk. Um, that is, that's my real name. I often joke that my parents have a sense of humor, but they tell me they love me. Okay. Um, so I am our executive assistant district attorney here at the Jefferson Parish DA's office. Prior to that, um, and where my, my true heart lies is I was the chief of the family violence unit. I have worked as the chief for ooh, five years prior to becoming the executive ADA. Prior to that, I was also a child abuse screener and a domestic violence screener of cases um, and prosecutor with going to trial. Um, I think what is unique about my experience is that I have had the pleasure of also prosecuting for the Denver District Attorney's Office when I lived out of state. And I lived out of state, ooh, it was after Katrina. I can tell you I moved a year after Katrina because prior to that, I was with the New Orleans DA's office for about five years. And I moved to Denver because that's home base, but then I got homesick and I say homesick, but just state sick and moved back to here to Louisiana to the Jefferson Parish DA's office. And my heart truly lies with prosecuting, you know, family violence type cases, domestic violence and child abuse. Mm -hmm. I also have the pleasure with working with the Louisiana District Attorneys Association in conjunction with them on the DV Prevention Commission. I see a lot of familiar faces. I saw Mariah on here. Mm -hmm. Also, I am part of the newly created DV Fatality Review, which we'll talk about in a minute. That's new legislation that I think is gonna help us with um, a lot of data collection and figuring out where we best place our resources going forward. I also sit on our child death review. So let me go ahead and see if I can move to the next slide here. Oh, it works. All right. I do want to talk about, you know, kind of take everybody, because I know, you know, a lot of people on, on this task force don't have a lot of the legal background or the prosecution background. So I'm going to talk about what happens when an arrest is made when we have intimate partner violence. We have a lot of tools in the toolbox to start. Well, we do now anyway, let's say that. I have a lot of tools in the toolbox to start with when it comes when an arrest is made, and that case then gets forwarded to the district attorney's office. I mean, oftentimes we do not get involved in the investigation aspects of, you know, intimate partner violence. That's the police function. But when the cases get to us, when an arrest is made, I think one of our, our often forgot tools is our Gwen's Law considerations. I think pretty much everybody is familiar with Gwen's Law. It's new to a newer to the world of prosecution. But it's a great tool when we're talking about doing early on assessments. Um, I can summarize Gwen's Law in saying that when an arrest is made, the court may, it will have to take into consideration certain factors. So I put this side up there for those that wanna read it. But the court may consider holding an alleged perpetrator for a period of time up to and not to exceed five days to gather more information about you know, any past instances of abuse, any information that goes on. So that's a great tool for us as prosecutors to use because we can talk to victims right away and we can get information and historical information that otherwise may not be in a police report. And so that's why that victim contact and the initial contact is so important. Sometimes we may not have an entire completed police report at that point in time, depending on the crime, but it gives the courts the opportunity to take into consideration factors and factors they otherwise wouldn't know just from reading a, a tiny little gist um, of information they get in order to set an appropriate bond, in order to place a protective order in place um, and to have one served. 
Secondly, I think everybody is pretty familiar with our new, new, newer 2018 legislation creating the firearms transfer laws. Firearms transfer laws apply to intimate partner violence situations where the courts, if a protective order is issued, and depending on other legal circumstances, can order that firearms be transferred from the alleged perpetrator out of the home or out of possession. And nine times out of 10, they're out of the home if the home is shared, but out of the possession um, of any potential, you know, perpetrator or alleged perpetrator. So that way it, it helps us ensure that victims stay safer. I think this law is pretty important because it's, you know, they, Statistics show states, which Louisiana, I'm very proud to say, we were, I want to say, the, the 17th state to have firearms laws transfer to put in place and the law put into place, that there is a 14% decrease in homicides within intimate partner violence in households when those firearms are transferred. So it's going to take us a while to collect the data on that, but it's a step in the right direction to have those laws. We also want to consider, especially upon arrest, um, and this goes back to also the police officers, the predominant aggressor doctrine. And I know in, in other meetings we've had, it has been talked about. I also wanna put the emphasis here with Title 46. For everybody unfamiliar, Title 46 is our Victims' Rights Act. Victims' rights, there are so many nuggets in Title 46. And in fact, a lot of the crimes within the revised statute in Title 14 now mirror provisions in Title 46 for victims' rights. So what we are looking for on the prosecution end is, has the predominant aggressor been identified? And if you look at Title 46, especially 46 40, it talks about the police officer's duties and specifically that law enforcement shall Evaluate each party separately to determine who is the predominant aggressor when it comes to intimate partner violence calls. Factors that they shall take into consideration, while not exhaustive, but including evidence from the complainants and other witnesses, neighbors, family members, etc., the extent of the personal injuries received by each person. And then that does become important when it comes to self defense whether a person acted in self-defense, prior complaints of abuse or dating partner violence, future welfare of any minors who are present at the scene and the existence of any protective orders that may be in place or historical protective orders. Um, as you can see, it's not exhaustive, but this is to ensure and hopefully as a guide to you know, curb the somewhat historical issue of what we call dual arrest or arrest, arresting each party when the police say, well, we just can't get to the bottom of it. So both of you are going to jail. But he said, she said, they said, they said. So we're trying to curb that. So Title 46 is pretty important. It's a pretty base guideline for directing law enforcement and for what prosecutors should look for. Um, and I think do. Now there are other great nuggets and I put this up there in Title 46. At this phase after an arrest, it's also important for us ADAs and district attorneys who have our victim assistance coordinators involved. Um, there are, within the DA's offices statewide, 135 victim assistance coordinators. I, I consider them to be a, a prosecutor's um, best right hands. Um, they are able to translate legal when it comes to talking to victims and survivors. And when it comes to communication, because a lot of times we will speak in terms of, you know, Title 46, we use acronyms, we use numbers, we use that. And that is a pretty scary place to be in. So our victim assistance coordinators traditionally do get involved after an arrest to help us and to gather more information. They are still bound by our same ethical obligations when it comes to Brady, Giglio, Kyles, et cetera for us when we gather that information, but they're, they are a kinder, friendlier voice um, for us in the courtroom when sometimes you know, our concentration has to be on what's going on ahead of us and, and the judges, they, you know, they're the eyes in the back of our head. And if anybody has any questions, just let me know as we go through this.
So that is what we talk about, you know, considerations when an arrest is made. Now I'm gonna fast forward here to factors, and this is by no means any bit um, an exhaustive list, but you know, charging decision factors. So an arrest has been made, we get the information as prosecutors and we have to decide, you know, what I, do we have something, a case that we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt? Um, I call them puzzle pieces. And I, I used to say this, you know, especially in the realm of children, because a lot of time kids who are witnesses, I think it's their burden to shoulder and it's not. Every little puzzle piece in a case matters, every piece of evidence matters. So first and foremost, you have your 911 calls. I mean, that is a great glimpse into the immediacy of what's happening. At this point, after the Gwen's Law, it may take a while, so you can have a completed police reports um, or reports, depending on how many officers are out there and depending on the, the nature of the case. We also do consultation with the police officers. You know, if there's something in there that's missing, we'll pick the phone up and say, hey, come talk with me and come talk with my investigator. Let's get more information here. Um, the most important thing when it comes to intimate partner violence are what we call prior calls for service. Whether an arrest is made or not, um, and this is also under the Victims' Rights Act, if there is any allegation of intimate partner violence, a police report has to be written whether or not action is taken with an arrest. So they can look up prior calls for service at any address or between individuals um, to, to garner a better picture of what's going on. Um, I know body can Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I'm taking you up on your word to interrupt. If I had a oh, question. please do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm just curious when, when, when the, the officers look at the prior calls for service, is it at the direct? Is this at the direction of the screening DA, or are they supposed to do this initially on their own? Um, that's sort of the first part of the question. And then the second part of the question is: Are they looking at prior calls for service just to that address, or to prior addresses that that person and and which person, you know, uh, the defendant also, and but also the vic the victim. That is a very good question. I will address the first one. Um, it's, we hope law enforcement does it because if you go back to the Title 46, they, it's part of their assessment, especially when it comes to predominant aggressor, to look at any past complaints. Now, sometimes they don't have all of the availability or the available databases. Here's a prime example is, say a couple moves to Jefferson Parish, yet, you know, they had prior service calls in Orleans Parish. They, when they are there, you know, the boots on the ground would not have that information available. But when that information gets to the district attorney's office, we also have investigators and access to be able to pull up and do that historical research based upon each individual person. And we know historically that oftentimes, you know, perpetrators will move between victims, so to speak. And, you know, if one abusive relationship ends, it doesn't mean that abuse ends. It means that abuse can be directed towards another individual. And so we do our best to look them up on everybody involved. So you get that clear picture. So it can be by name. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Okay, perfect. And, and nowadays, I mean, we see it on the news all the time where electronic evidence is key. We have our phones, our computers, surveillance cameras, home surveillance cameras. I mean, you know, we've had cases where, what is it, Alexis, you know, that, that home thing you can talk to to turn on music has captured some information um, about, you know, criminal activity. So that is again, another puzzle piece that we like to look to, to take the onus off of victims and survivors when it comes to, you know, what happened and what has happened before. Next, we have, obviously, we consult with our victims, our survivors, you know, family members, children. And, you know, I think it was Miss Martin in the last call who brought up children. And that's a, a pretty special place in my heart because I spent so many years specifically doing child abuse. You know, children are incredible little beings and they're sponges. And so when they are witnesses, 
we like them or victims. We also like them to be sent to our children's advocacy centers. That is, you know, we go back to the, the science behind having a child questioned in an independent environment, you know, not by a police officer who might look real scary with a badge and a gun and everything else and in the commotion and the chaos of a moment. So we look towards having those particular pieces of the puzzle put together. Second, and I think this is really, really important, and this just goes through the whole entire process, is our communication with defense counsel. I, and I can say this as having been a line DA and a supervisor, it is so important to foster that relationship so somebody feels comfortable coming to you and saying, hey, Sonny, my client said X, can you look into it? And, and those are part of the mitigating factors that can happen. And, you know, it's, it's a very important for us to be open to that. I think a lot of ADAs are open to it. And I'll tell you because but Perry Mason only worked on television, not in real life. None of us ever want to be surprised, you know, when it comes to anything in a courtroom or anything that we can prevent because court is traumatizing and it's traumatizing for a lot of people who've never been there. And it's a very scary place to be. Even when I first went to court as a young VA, it was very intimidating, very scary. So somebody who doesn't have knowledge of the system and who doesn't necessarily want to be there and, you know, feels intimidated by it, all of this stuff needs to work through the communication and the process with defense counsel and ADA. So I hope a lot of our ADAs are open to, and I think they are, and defense attorneys with sharing what information they can legally share. I mean, there's a lot of obviously protected communications that cannot be shared, um, but that, that line of communication is super important so we can make the right decisions. Um, I, I threw in here also cultural sensitivities. Um, this, is, this is pretty big when you have some, some diverse communities is to be able to also understand, I know we do trainings on it about, you know, particular, whether it's a particular religion or a particular, you know, culture, ethnicity, to understand, you know, what, what goes on and what is behind it. I mean, again, we're a pretty scary place to be when somebody is now thrust into the, the criminal justice system. So we wanna make it as welcoming as possible and as easy as possible, but that's also for us to be able to be aware of those sensitivities out there, especially in the, the religious realm when it comes to, to certain crimes and especially intimate partner violence. I mean, there are still, still, a lot of misnomers out there about intimate partner violence where, you know, and I hear this all the time. Well, if it's in the home, it should stay in the home. Mm, not necessarily. No, it shouldn't. So it's important for that safety aspect, but it's also important for us to be able to be aware of that. I, I think a lot of people have heard about the, the movement towards evidence-based evidence prosecution. Evidence-based prosecution is you look at all of your puzzle pieces, irrespective of your victim or your survivor, and that is to take pretty much the burden off of them and put it upon all evidence. And the best analogy I can use is, uh, unfortunately, a homicide case. In a homicide, you don't have a victim to say what happens, but you have to put the puzzle pieces together and so there is a shift and a movement. In fact, we are working on this with the Domestic Violence Prevention Commission is to put more emphasis and training for law enforcement on the types of evidence needed to go forward with our intimate partner violence cases. So those, this is just a very small list of all the factors that factor into whether we accept a case for prosecution or whether we refuse the charge because we can't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Before I move to the next slide, does anybody have any questions? No? All right. Okay. I threw in here also the legal guidelines for charging. Self-defense is truly not the only legal guideline. Let's be very honest. We have our ethical guidelines. I, there's more, but I know there have been a lot of talk about you know, self-defense 
self-defense in Louisiana, I wanted to put these, um, this information in here as just a citation if anybody is interested in reading cases or looking up exactly what law it is. There is a difference between when it comes to self-defense in a homicide and self-defense in a non-homicide case. And this isn't just for intimate partner violence. This runs the gamut of all crimes um, or all motives and all parties involved. So when it comes to self-defense in a homicide case, the state does have the burden of proving or disproving, excuse me, self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. So it actually imputes two burdens upon the state or the prosecution to one, prove the case and the facts and the elements of the facts beyond a reasonable doubt, two, to also disprove that it occurred in self-defense. Now, non-homicide cases are different when it comes to self-defense, say, I don't know, armed robbery or any type of case that is non it's not a homicide, then that burden actually shifts to the defendant, but it's beyond a preponderance, or it's by a preponderance of the evidence, not beyond reasonable doubt. And as I will let you know, preponderance of the evidence is a lower standard um, than beyond a reasonable doubt. We were schooled in law school, you can't give numbers attached to it, but it's a lot lower burden. There are some pretty lengthy definitions out there for it. I will not bore you with all of it. Um, but you can also look at you know, the, the other two statutes I threw in here about the aggressor cannot claim self-defense that's under you know, 1421 and defense of others, which does happen in intimate partner violence situations. When we have um, witnesses or somebody who intervenes, maybe you know, somebody on the street, et cetera. So does anyone have any questions about that? No? All uh, right. Um, well, I had a good oh. question. Oh, th th of thank course. you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, you know, in these sorts of cases, if there are any guidelines for prosecutors looking at the stand your ground provisions in intimate partner violence, uh, self-defense cases. We've seen a lot of cases where um, women are in their own homes when they have killed their intimate partners. And so I'm just wondering how that factors in. Abs well, okay, yes, it does. Um, and as far as guidelines go, no. Um, but I can tell you that that is also looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and a lot of times when you have in play the stand your ground, when you have in place self-defense, um, some law enforcement agencies will also not even make an arrest. They will just refer it to the respective district attorney's office for review. So as far as a set of guidelines and particularized guidelines, no, it's really just following the case law and the specific facts of a case. Um, so I don't know if that, that helps or if you uh, have any other questions based on that. Okay. No, All right, so we're, oops, sorry. I said, thank you. Thank you for your answer. You're welcome, okay. <laughs> All right, let's talk about once charges are filed. Um, there are a significant number of cases that get refused for prosecution because we do not feel we can meet our burden beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, if we do accept charges in, in any case, this goes to all cases, but specifically intimate partner violence, um, it, we're looking at kind of a three things you can do. The case can be dismissed, the case can end up in some sort of plea or plea agreement, or the case can go to trial. And throughout this process, this is when it even becomes more important, because I know a lot of times, I, and I put communication with defense counsel first, especially when it comes to intimate partner violence. And I've said this as many times as I've taught around the state, you know, intimate partner violence is so different than a theft. It's different than an armed robbery because what you're dealing with are people's emotions. You are dealing with you know, intervening factors and you are getting into a relationship that most crimes don't offer or even lend themselves to that. You know, a lot of times it might be strangers, it might be, you know, in passing or say it's a contractor fraud. Intimate partner violence is so different. And that's why I put communication with defense counsel because sometimes you are not going to have the same defense counsel from the time a person is arrested through the trial or through a plea. So at this stage, I think it's the most critical because that way, they can develop a relationship and garner information um, from the accused 
and provide that or what they can provide to the prosecution. And I think it is also your communication with your victim, your survivor, witnesses is super important at that stage as well, because it helps you get down and get more information. I mean, I, as a prosecutor, I fear what I don't know. I would rather have all of the information then make you know the best decisions we can. And again, I say continued evidence evaluation. It can be that say a cell phone was analyzed and you didn't get that cell phone information because you know forensics, whatever, didn't come back. And it comes back after you've made a charging decision and you have information in there. Well, you have to, we have an obligation to continue to evaluate our evidence. And evaluation of evidence also includes talking to the survivor, talking to witnesses, talking to your defense counsel to gather more information. Mm -hmm. In addition, um, competency evaluations of accused are taken and given a lot of weight in criminal cases. And I know in intimate partner violence, you know, there's a, sometimes an escalation when it comes to mental health. And so that's important. You know, a lot of times company evaluations, competency evaluations may not basically uh, be afforded to catch all of that information, but they are super helpful to us if we can have them or if the situation case by case lends itself. Um, and again, I know last time we talked about experts and I think I think the shift to using experts more is, is great. I mean, there are experts when it comes to intimate partner violence, the dynamics of it, experts when it comes to strangulation, that I, I think I would, if I can say this, I mean, I would love to see us use those experts more because it goes back to the educational component and educating the courts, the courtroom, everybody involved, the public about intimate partner violence. I mean, I still think to this day, we hear sometimes, you know, like I said before, well, if it happened behind closed doors, keep it behind closed doors. Mm, no, sometimes a, that's just not the right thing to do. And so we have to to be able to educate people, especially, you know, I hear it a lot of times, well, why did they stay? Well, there's a host of reasons that we know through historically with intimate partner violence, you know, financial, emotional, uh, you name it, there are a plethora of reasons, um, you know, the hope that it's gonna get better, et cetera. So experts and, better, and more prolific use would be great um, for that. So, also an often underutilized tool. I'm sorry, I, I just oh, yeah. wanted to go back up before we got too far down. Um, around the communication part, the communicating with defense counsel to receive mitigating information or communicating with survivors. I'm not an attorney, so I always want attorneys to like break the logistics down. So in the context of what we've been talking about in this task force, what would it look like for you as a prosecutor, you know, with one of these cases we're talking about where someone killed an abuser in self-defense or was coerced into a crime and the defense counsel comes to you and says, well, my client says that, you know, he strangled her multiple times and she was forced to kill him, et cetera, et cetera. And then maybe you've also got like children saying, yes, we witnessed abuse. Like what, so then like, what do you as a prosecutor do with that information from that point? That's a really good question. Um, what we do with that information is try to find corroboration for it. And, and we do that, like I go back to sort of the evidence-based prosecution, you know, it's like, okay, let me talk to the kids and let me go, you know, have the kids go to the child advocacy center, have them, you know, be interviewed and, you know, especially depending on the age of the child, um, have them interviewed in a, you know, what basically the science scientifically, I don't want to say mandated, but scientifically proven atmosphere. So we can take all of that information and put it together. And then it's, and, and we would ask, I would ask, say, if defense attorney came to me and said, you know, hey, Sonny, you know, my client says, you know, she was strangled multiple times. Okay. Who saw it? Who, who did she or he talk to about it? Who did, and then track those individuals down to get that information. So it's, it's always looking for that corroboration and does it sort of match the facts at hand as well so it's really getting to the nuts and bolts of like hey can i talk to so and so 
I mean, I was recently screening a case and defense came to me. I said, all right, give me the person's phone number. And I called them up and they gave me information. And it was very helpful information just to know the totality of circumstances. Um, so we would look for, you know, with that information, the corroboration and something that we can, individuals we can talk to, or whether it's, say it's an old phone that maybe the, the accused had that has text messages on it, that maybe the police never got. I mean, if, if defense attorney says, hey, here's text messages, it's an old phone number, but here's some stuff on this phone, or here's pictures, here's et cetera, that's what we're looking for. So I, have a, uh -huh. I have a question to kind of piggyback on that because I've, I know there's been situations where survivors do have children as witnesses and police were instructed to take those children to CACs to be interviewed, which is a very more, like it's a, a much better environment. But what ends up happening is even if it's a detective that's not in a uniform, they go in, they have their gun on their belt and they're standing like, is, is there a process where a defense attorney could then go back to you and be like, look, yeah, the kids didn't talk to them, but they also were not in an environment that allowed for that disclosure to, like, is there something that you all as prosecutors could then be a power to say to somebody, hey, no, do this at the CAC? Because I, I find that doesn't always happen in, in certain other areas too. No, and Morgan, that's a really good comment. I mean, that is true. I think sometimes in the, the busyness of investigations, you know, they, and, and look, sometimes the officers will get, we hope, what we call a minimal disclosure or a minimal, you know, anything, even if, but if the child shuts down and then two months later when, you know, as we say, the dust has settled a little bit, absolutely, there are mechanisms where we as prosecutors can call up the, the detective and say, hey, you know, I, I would really like, and let's see if we can get this done because this child may have, a, you know, a lot of good information. So yes, we can always go back after the fact and request it. Yeah. Sunny, I'm sorry. Um, huh? you, you, yeah, sort of unpacking a lot of the things that you were you were talking about. And, and one of the things I know that, that we've seen a lot with clients here in the Women's Prison Project is a lot of the prior violence happened, of course, privately. I mean, that, that's the, that's right. That's what intimate partner violence is. And so there aren't witnesses. And of course, um, a lot of our clients were ashamed of, of being in, you know, involved in that situation and in those relationships and didn't, don't share with family and friends who, who are quite frankly, they're isolated from family and friends. So there's no one to share it with. So I, I guess, you know, I certainly understand um, when there's corroborating evidence, how helpful that can be. But I guess I, I'm wondering how, uh, how to, I mean, and you've seen it right on the other end when you're trying to prosecute um, uh, perpetrators, but from a defense lawyer's perspective, so you can't get corroborating because all of this violence, the strangulation, the abuse occurred behind closed doors and there are no um, other witnesses. How can um, the defense then, you know, what can the defense do to sort of help the prosecutor understand and expand on sort of, uh, you know, having the history of abuse register with the DA in their calculation, I guess is, is what I'm saying. And that, that is a very fair question. I mean, it, it, here's what I would offer up is, Usually there can be some sort of nuggets, like, you know, the person will call in sick to work or, and if the defense counsel is willing to share with me specifics, because we all remember the traumatizing moments in our life, we do. And so if you can remember a specific, like I knew it happened Christmas Eve because, you know, the meal wasn't prepared or whatever factor is in there, um, I welcome that because you can gauge and it, we never take what any, you know, victim says carte blanche. We have to go back and get those corroborative nuggets is then go back to the victim and say, hey, tell me about, you know, Christmas Eve on whatever time, what was going on and what was happening. And, and you can usually tell from there, there's a, you know, it's, it's hard when you go back 
at someone with additional information for them to be able to, to lie well on the spot. Um, I guess, you know, police do that all the time. It's sort of the same way, but that has to be a comfort level between defense counsel and the prosecutor to give those, those details enough. Um, you know, I rem and a lot of times it can be, I remember it was after, you know, we were out celebrating X or it happens and I had just, I don't know, changed the comforter on the bed or bought a new comforter. There, there are details that we can use to then question a victim about to garner more information and to garner whether, you know, there's, there's truthfulness to it. And a lot of times, you know, a victim would say, well, you know, call my mom or, you know, call so-and-so and they can verify us. And so then if we do call, we kind of go down the rabbit trail, I say. And so if you do call and you get that feeling like, wait a minute, no, there's, there's more information here. Um, and I know this is very, I, I, it would scare a lot of defense attorneys. I have had them when we are in these predicaments say, and I've told them, I said, look, can I talk to your client with you present? Obviously nothing we say can be used, but just to get down to the truth and get to the bottom of it. That, that's almost like a nuclear option. And that's a very scary one for a lot of defense attorneys. Um, but well, it's well, really- Well, that's funny. I was going to ask you if you've ever used a use immunity um, contract in that kind of a situation. When it comes to intimate partner violence, I have not, um, but it's not out of the, the realm of possibility. Um, I have had, I have had defense attorneys allow me to, to speak with their clients, obviously with them present, um, to talk about and to really just kind of garner the sincerity and the, you know, because when you're, when you're reliving a traumatic moment, we all do it. There are such nuggets of truth. And when it comes to our body language, when it comes to what we say, the details we remember, and just to gauge for ourselves as the, the prosecutor who's supposed to be the, the independent fact finder and can I prove this case beyond reasonable doubt. So it, it really runs the gamut of, of ways to do it. But it's, it's really, it's a hard one when all of it happened outside of the children's eyes or outside of, um, you know, without telling your best friend or without, you know, telling mom or dad or your aunt or, or whoever, or your best buds that this happened. But we look for, you know, that as we say, the devil is in the details. And when you, when you remember the details and when you can get down to the bottom of it, there is a lot of truth in those details. So that information helps us when we go back and talk to the victim who was alleged this occurred. I, I feel we've really derailed you and you've taken you off. It's so okay. I apologize. Go, 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 go back to. <laughs> okay, here we go. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Oh, you're welcome. All right, pre sentence investigation reports by parole and probation. Again, an underutilized tool because it does give them, it, 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 this obviously is after, you know, a, a trial, but it would, it gives the court perspective. And I say an underutilized tool, it will give a court perspective to hear anything that did not come out at a trial, especially from the accused perspective. So I, I just think, you know, we, we could use more of those. I think it's a, a great tool. When I prosecuted in Colorado, every single case had a pre-sentence investigation report and it was such a useful tool because you learned so much more. You learned about mitigation, you learned about, you know, historical facts, you learned about potential mental health issues. I ran the gambit of information that you didn't have prior to a trial. Um, and that's a lot of it. That, that's something that a defense attorney would request from parole and probation. What, what, what are the um, steps for using that? Yeah, either party can request it. Mm -hmm. And even the judge can request it. All right. Okay, moving on. Here we go. After post sentencing decisions, there are several avenues when it comes to, say, a person is convicted. Um, you have your appeals, you have your post conviction. And in our newest law, 930.10, I've also, you might see him on here. I have invited Darren Alamond 
who is, I refer to our resident um, legislative genius, and he's very wonderful at helping us write and craft our laws. He, along with uh, Mr. Wembley, who is our former first assistant, who now heads up our Conviction Integrity Unit here in Jefferson Parish, crafted this legislation. It's part of the, the DNA, it's part of the actual innocence, um, but, but I really want, you know, for for intimate partner violence, our big key into this is the provision as it regards to post-conviction plea agreements. And this has to do with addressing, you know, in cases like Ms. Starr's case, you know, historical, historical cases where a lot was different back in the day. And so this allows, it, it's now, we, have, we actually have a legitimate vehicle to come in and and do our best to gather all the information and make the right decision about that. I don't know, Darren, if you wanna to pipe off and, and talk about it. Sure, I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, 930.10 has two distinct provisions. They're kind of related. I envision them being used in different contexts. The first one, subsection A is just the catch all upon joint motion of the state. And the defense, the court may deviate from the provisions of this title, this title being post conviction law. You know, one context this can be potentially used in is say a guy pleads guilty to a drug crime and the labs later come back to say no CDS. A motion under this subsection would be a way to vacate the conviction in the interest of justice that could also potentially be used if compelling evidence comes out later that, you know, survivor was prosecuted and we find blockbuster evidence later saying she should not have been prosecuted. It, it, I, would, I would suggest the actual innocence law in this same act, um, which is Article 926.2 would also apply, but this is kind of a faster way to do it where the DA and the defendant agree. Subsection B is a little bit different, but also kind of related. This deals with post-conviction plea agreements. This was kind of designed for situations where say, the defendant's guilt is not in question, but maybe there's, say, a different interest of justice concern with the case. Like, we might use this in a case where, say, somebody was multiple billed under an older version of the multiple bill statute that was a lot more draconian, and that even though the person's sentence is and was legal, maybe that's not in keeping with our multiple bill practices today. It's kind of another way to revisit excessively long sentences. Uh, it just basically gives flexibility where the state and the defense agree that something needs to be done with this case. And of course, the court's consent is still required. Mm -hmm. I apologize so just if I miss this. Um, Darren, can you introduce yourself so I can record that in the notes? Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, Darren Alamon with um, the Jefferson Parish DA's office at LDAA. And Darren, can I ask, or Sunny, maybe either of you know, have you used, have you had opportunities to use um, either of A or B yet? Um, and, and, and what about state, if you happen to know statewide, how, how, how pervasive either of those provisions are being used? I know since this has been passed, there have been a ton of requests statewide. I'm not sure how often they've been acting on. I know since this went into effect last August, I'm pretty sure we've used A at least once in just what I said, a drug case where the labs came back negative and, you know, we're like, well, the guy pled, but since he's clearly not guilty, we do want to vacate his conviction and let him walk because if the labs are negative, they're negative. I'm not aware of our office using B since it's been enacted. You know, previously it was kind of our, our position that this could be done anyway under the inherent authority of the court, nothing forbade it. So we have done this even before B went into effect, but we thought it was best to kind of flesh out a mechanism. Mm -hmm. But we have done what B authorized even before B went into effect because it was our reading of the code that there was nothing prohibiting it. And I would echo Darren's sentiments. Um, this is a, a pretty new law, and but it, it has, it really does legitimize what several DA's offices around the state have done previously or you would have to carve out, you know, you'd have to get to the legal exception through a bunch of hoops to get to because you knew it was the right decision and the right thing to do. So this is the vehicle that, that legitimizes us being able to go into court when we realize, okay, maybe, you know, the sentence for say, and I'll use drugs in this case, but like a possession with intent to distribute marijuana was an excessive sentence. And so we have been able to 
to now have a legitimate vehicle that is an easier vehicle to drive, to get back into port, to use it. I do anticipate, I can tell you, our office has been, we have received a lot, a lot of requests. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, doing our best to treat similarly situated people the same and come up with a, a mechanism to, to make sure that we're doing justice by all who would apply to us under this provision. All right. Anything else, Sean? I, I had a question if I could ask, um, Mr. Arlen. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the presentation on this aspect. Um, I was wondering if, you know, this factual innocence provision is new, but um, there have obviously been some developments in society as well as in the literature and among studies about um, different aspects of intimate partner violence. And so I'm wondering if you think that under the factual innocence provision, some of that, some of our updated thinking about intimate partner violence, perhaps in addition to you know corroborating evidence or additional testimony about the dynamics of a relationship, could be a basis for seeking relief under the factual innocence law. I'm not sure the factual innocence law would be the best vessel there because it requires that the evidence to prove factual innocence be scientific test, scientific, physical, forensic, or non-testimonial documentary or testimonial evidence that's corroborated by that type of evidence. So um, it's not altogether clear that that would be able to click that box, but that's where I think 930.10 comes in. If there's a case where we think it's just compelling, even though it doesn't fit the factual innocence provision, subsection A would give us a way to go in and vacate the conviction. And if we don't think the conviction should be vacated, but we think maybe the sentence is extreme, subsection B would come in. Thank you. Do you I have a, another question. Do you, sure. you did you say something about you did know that there was 23 requests under this provision? Did I hear that right? Or, or in your office? Uh, Sonny, did you say 23? Because I mean, we had we've had quite a few. I don't no, have an exact number. Yeah. Sonny, do you? No, no, no number put few. on it. Um, I can tell you we've had many, many requests for it. Um, as far as a specific number, I do not know. Um, and I don't know of that number that would be attributed to intimate partner violence. So I just know we we have numerous requests. How are the requests coming in? Like, is it a defense attorney or because I'm just wondering, too, it would be nice to be able to capture data about sort of the summaries of when these are also being granted so then people can easily know sort of the factual basis that would you know so that way the not that there is bias but the potential to see where okay in this district attorney's office this is what's being granted versus this district attorney i mean that's i think one of the the problems just as a whole in louisiana that we're constantly seeing is that we don't know the data and then trying to collect the data and then everyone having equal access to the data is is, is sometimes a, a barrier, you know. Well, and I can tell you that it, it, the data is, a, is going to be a hard calculation because all of these are reviewed on a case by case basis. And so it, it, it really is, I guess, a fresh look at a case and while there are parameters within each office as they are developed, it, data won't necessarily capture what is particular and what is unique to every circumstance um, because you have, you have age difference, you have you know, the, the legal differences, you have uh, circumstantial differences, you have evidentiary differences. I, I don't think there would be a catch-all category or a way to necessarily have data make sense without assessing it on a case by case basis. Any other any questions about that? Is there um is there like a have there been any discussions I guess statewide among different district attorneys offices about you know, which sort of cases both 930.10 and the factual innocence provisions should, should like can or should be used for, and obviously specifically with respect to this task force. Um, you know, if there are any efforts to look, I mean, 
you know, there are like the DNA exoneration cases, which I think are kind of like historically some of the most obvious cases for, for this sort of thing. But um, have there been any, any discussions statewide among district attorney's offices about looking at cases where um, intimate partner violence survivors were convicted and using these provisions? Um, I do not know the answer to that question. I don't know. Was actually, it's funny, I, I have to chime in because that was on my list of things to do. Oh, I'm sorry. To ask you all, no, 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 to ask how could we use that if, if we could, you know, as one of the things the task force might somehow have a hand in is sort of asking how, how the, you know, DA's association might be or can it be um, enlisted to sort of encourage DA's around the state to, oh, I apologize, to use, um, to use the, the, st the new statute to look at these cases, sort of along the lines of the Curley decision and so forth. Well, and, and I can tell you, I mean, obviously that is definitely something that the task force um, can look into and make those recommendations. As it comes to sort of, you know, a, a, a check the box, um, as prosecutors, we would not be able to do that because, um, you know, going back to the Oh yeah, yeah no, they, no, I, I certainly wouldn't. Like right, as you said, every case is individual, absolutely. But there could be a process where certain kinds of cases get reviewed or get looked at, for instance. Yes, I mean, if that, I, I would, I would suggest that being a recommendation from the task force when it comes to the intimate partner violence cases in relation to Article Three, nine thirty point ten. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that is something you think that that certainly the DA's association would entertain or at least consider. Um, I do believe yes. Um, as far as how the mechanics of it, I I cannot commit them to that. Of course, um, of course. Sure. until we see you know mechanics and and have that discussion about you know what the data that we're able to capture or the you know the the info sort of the, the structure we would a be able to do it under. So I couldn't speak to, but yes, do we keep an open mind and are we happy to listen and absorb all of it and do our best to, to do our best to be a contributor to this? Absolutely. Well, I think that that's a useful thing. And again, a little later after you finish, we'll, we'll be talking about thoughts about what our report might include. And, and I think that might be one, something we think about. I apologize, uh, Sunny, please. Okay. Keep. <laughs> Anyone else before I move on? Yeah, I see that um, uh, Professor Konkar has her hand raised. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to first thank you for doing this presentation. And then um, I had a quick question. You know, I've spent the vast majority of my career working, you know, with victims who are who who are designated as victims in the criminal justice system, where prosecutors are are working with them, um, and law enforcement is working with them um, on their safety issues. And so, as I've worked with more and more, um, you know, victim defendants, uh, as you know, um, we sometimes call them. Um, you know, one of the things I've noticed is that some of the um, uh, people working in prosecutors' offices and some of the people working in the law enforcement law enforcement community who have the most training in intimate partner violence are not necessarily involved in the homicide investigations or not necessarily involved in charging decisions when. Um, a victim of domestic violence kills an abusive partner um, or, or in sort of how those cases end up playing out um, when they get prosecuted um, because there's some very obvious patterns that might easily be recognized by a prosecutor who's highly trained in intimate partner violence versus a prosecutor who in general is prosecuting, you know, non um uh, IPV related homicides. And so um, is that also, um, you know, same thing with like homicide detectives, you know, versus 
um, other officer, you know, a domestic violence detective who, who would have more training. So um, is that also a pattern that you've noticed? And, and do you think it would, it, um, um, I'd just be interested in, in hearing um, what, what you think about some of those divisions that we sometimes see in offices about um, on these kinds of issues. I can tell you, I have not um, experienced that and I have not heard it from other district attorney's offices. I know our DAs are dedicated and it's, it's interesting to watch when a new ADA gets hired and they will come on board and you just know it if they're the type of cases you wanna do and the type of cases you're gonna educate yourself upon. And, and that goes also with our law enforcement. I can tell you that, you know, most recently at our biggest conference here with the LDA, we had a, you know, trauma-informed survivor specific um, member from Georgia come down to educate. And there were a significant number of ADAs and district attorneys at the meeting and at that conference to talk about trauma-informed survivors. Um, so I think, I think the education is growing. I haven't noticed a, you know, a difference between those who are interested in it and those who actually are the, I'll call it the boots on the ground and those who, who are within that charging realm, especially because of all the, the supervisory authority and over an individual, over a detective, over, you know, an ADA, so no, I haven't personally witnessed any of that. In fact, I have seen the opposite where our district attorneys and you know the dedicated homicide detectives are very passionate to learn about intimate partner violence and about the dynamics of it. And while they're, if they're young and they're new to it, they're eager to learn and eager to learn those dynamics. And in fact, I mean, I know for, I think it's over the last five years, the LDA alone has, you know, educated, I believe over like 4,000 members of law enforcement, including, you know, law enforcement, district attorneys, and sometimes judges in there because we do, you know, present at judge judicial conferences. So I have in fact noticed the opposite of where you have dedicated individuals who, who are assigned to that. And I've noticed it, you know, in the child abuse realm, especially when it comes to unfortunately homicides of children, you know, you have detectives who, who pour their heart and soul into it and who want to do it. And then you have other detectives who say, uh, assign him. And, and prosecutors are the same way where it's, yeah, I've just, I've, I've had a different perspective of that, um, but I would be interested in knowing more about, you know, the specifics of, of that. Sunny, I wanted before, because I think there are probably some more questions. I don't know if, um, I don't, I don't want to stop you before you're done. And, and so I encourage you if, you, if we want to return, and then we can follow up with some other questions. I know. I can tell you we're almost done. <laughs> it's up to y'all. Go for it. Go for it. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> All right, let's go here. All right, solutions going forward. Um, I always say, you know, there's never a problem that I've met that I can't solve, even though it, 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 that's probably not true. But I like to think that every problem has a solution. So I, I think education is key. I mean, I, I think I just talked about the educational component with, you know, the LDA alone doing its education. I know for those of you on here who know Lieutenant Martinez Jordan, she and I embarked on a statewide tour when it came to the firearms transfer to do a full day's training all across the state. Um, we educated over 1,200 in law enforcement as to the mechanisms of that new law. So education is key. And so I think it's with the law enforcement, prosecution, defense counsel, you know, our judicial entities to give them education and keep moving forward about intimate partner violence. Um, I think also, you know, resources for our nonprofit intimate partner violence prevention community coordinators, and I put DV shelters because I hate that term, but I put it on there so people, you know, it's an old school term. It's not that great, but we could we could have many many more resources their way to talk about prevention. I always say, any life saved is worth everything that we do. Um, I did add this with cooperation and communication with other commissions, especially with the birth of the DV fatality review for statewide. I think that can offer the task force. I think that coupled with the Domestic Violence Prevention Commission 
can really get together and, and do a lot of brainstorming to help the educational efforts moving forward. So I think communication would be key. Um, and then again, assessing our historical cases under the 930.10, that's obviously on a case-by-case -case review with um, the respective district attorneys, but that is one, one incredible tool in the toolbox to keep using. So those, those would be you know, part of the solution moving forward for the task force. Here, I've added these slides, y'all can keep them. Um, I just put these in here to let you know about LDA legislation, you know, of recent. You know, we've expanded our, our DV criminal statutes to include same-sex couples. That was one heck of a feat. I thank Darren and I thank um, Pete Adams, who is Lauren Lampert now took over for him and obviously now Senator Pat Connick for, for really helping spearhead this. That was one heck of one heck of a fight. So so I say thanks to them. Um, again, you know, we created the dating partner statutes. Um, you know, we also expanded public records to actually redact out addresses and contact information for survivors out of public records. We've expanded Louisiana law on harassing phone calls because that statute wasn't keeping up with technology. Um, we also changed the law. This was a, a very tragic case here out of Jefferson Parish where unfortunately the person who caused the death um, of the spouse was arrested and the, the victim's family did not have disposition over the victim's remains. Unfortunately, it was that spouse. So we went in and changed that law. We cleaned up some of the gun divestiture laws, the firearms transfer to help better protect our victims. Um, you know, the Crime Victims Reparation Board, we lightened that up to include before this, if you had any criminal offense, you were not entitled to it, which seemed a pretty unfair assessment. Um, 2020, you know, but that parole eligibility for second degree rape, that's, you know, we just put it in there to let you know that we were you know, very conscientious because sometimes second degree rape does include intimate partner violence. And there are the sentencing enhancers with second degree so we can keep our intimate partner violence statutes together. Y'all can have a copy of this. I know I'm going through real quick, but I want to get to your questions. Um, we did in 2020 overhaul the, um, as best we could, the protective order statutes to include a whole host of things that are much better designed to protect our victims. Mm -hmm. And especially in the wake of COVID because mm -hmm. protective orders would expire. And unfortunately during COVID, we got a lot of phone calls saying my order expired, yet you couldn't get into court. So we went and legislatively fixed that to where they, they do not expire until the disposition of the case. Um, obviously we talked about the legislation creating factual innocence. Um, and I did talk about the new domestic um, abuse fatality review panel that has been created. And that is the, oh wait, oh, sorry, one more. Oh, we did do this. Um, when it comes to juveniles or cruelty for juveniles, as we know, kids, you know, when you're in intimate partner situations, nine times out of 10, 10 kids may be affected. Um, so we increase the prescriptive period from when a child turns 18. So, it, or it doesn't start to run until they turn 18. And that's it. So I'm done. <laughs> well, no question. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, that so was like the whirlwind of it. Yeah, Sorry. no, no, I, I, I uh, I really, really appreciate um, your your speaking, and I think we I I want to open it up to more questions. Although we obviously took you at your word and started asking you questions during the talk, so good that that was good, um, folks. Do do anyone have uh, does anyone have any questions for Sunny that they would like to address specifically about some of the things she talked about here? Well, I I, I have one. Um, that I, I will lead off. So again, Sunny, when, one of the things that we see here um, with the Women's Prison Project cases is that quite a few of our clients are who, be, they, who are survivors of intimate partner who then become um, defendants in, after they've um, killed an abusive partner. The, the homicide actually occurs in their home, not the shared home, but actually in the home of uh, the what ends up being the de the defendant, and and I guess one of the questions I have is how 
does and, and maybe how could we use the sort of stand your ground? I mean, I guess it would seem to me that it, from a screen, from a DA screening perspective, that if once you see that this happened in a particular person's home, that wasn't a shared home, that that should be a, a, a sort of a big red flag to be doing more particularized investigation and, and be more careful about how you proceed in, in making a screening decision. And I guess wondering, is that true? Or if it's not true, how could we go about encouraging that to happen in a way that, that protects these, these women who are in their own homes at the time that they're being, that their partner is, is um, you know, attacking them? And that's a really good question. Um, and I'm, I'm going to give you the short answer and then I'm going to clarify it. Um, the short answer is it depends on a case by case basis. Um, but the, the longer answer is, is it goes back to sort of the, the corroborating circumstances. I mean, if you have, you know, say text message, like I'm gonna, you know, kill you, I'm gonna come in, you know, you look to other corroborative information that lends itself to looking at that. Um, then it also comes down to that communication or information that the prosecution otherwise wouldn't know from defense counsel if they're allowed to share it or if they're willing to share it. And so it, it really just boils down to that, that case specific because the nuances of each of those cases are very different. Um, but I think in going back to the component about a solution with education with law enforcement. Um, I think that would be the, the first layer is to increase the efforts to educate on the type of evidence that we would be looking for and that would be needed to prove and or disprove it either which way. I mean, the truth is the truth. So I think that the best way to tackle that is with the educational component for law enforcement, you know, anybody involved in, in the criminal justice system, including our nonprofits. Um, I don't see Mary Claire on here, but I think she's been here in the past, um, Mary Claire Landry from the Family Justice Center. And so it, it would include that I would start with the educational component, but as it relates to each of those cases, you have to, to assess them on a case by case basis. And I don't want that to sound like a cop out answer, but it's really hard to give a. a... I mean, I, I guess I certainly understand. Obviously, every case is individual. I, I guess yeah. I, I'm, I'm thinking about things and tools and 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 suggestions we can make. And one of them I'm wondering is, you know, that that if it's in a person's own home, that there ought to be sort of some like a presumption or a flag that that this is a case that involves uh, stand your ground and, and that a prosecutor then should sort of try to be looking at whether or not there's evidence to suggest it wasn't a stand your ground, sort of like a, you know, a rebuttable presumption kind of thing um, before screening to, to choose to prosecute um, a case like that. That, that. That's sort of what I was getting at. It's, there is some recommendation that could be made for that kind of, uh, a process? Um, as far as a, a, a recommendation about how prosecutors would look at it, um, I think my rec recommendation would come in just that, again, it goes back to the education of going back to, you know, the, the legalities and specific, specifically assessing the evidence you have and or having law enforcement go back and look for evidence if there's any questions in that case. Uh, I see Rutha has her hand up. I think, Rutha Chatwood, do you have a question? Oh, no, I apologize. That's my cursor that suddenly makes a funny looking hand when it, uh, that was my fault. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Sunny? Yeah, Sunny, I know, I mean, I know you just said, you know, it's all case by case basis and um, didn't have a specific recommendation in that instance. I am wondering though, in general, since this is like our last big discussion task force meeting, what um, you see as 
possible to come from the LDAA to address this problem? I mean, I really appreciate this list of acts that you provided because the legislative website is not the easiest to navigate. And so I think this like this long list really shows that, you know, when y'all identify a problem happening over and over, you do use legislation to address it. Um, and so what what do you think that we could write in as recommendations that could be, you know, brought hand in hand with the LDAA, like y'all have done um, with all these other ones? Um, I, that's a hard question to answer because I think it would all have to be a, a very specific crafted statute um, and, and crafted in a way. I, I learned this when doing the same sex legislation that I, I thought it was going to be easy because I thought it was just an equal protection violation and you know our laws were going to be declared unconstitutional. I was wrong. Um, there was a lot of opposition and, and a lot of opposition for various reasons around. And so I think it would have to be that, you know, we are willing to come to a table to with solutions, but it has to be solutions that the collective good can, can live with within the confines of the law. So I know that doesn't really answer the questions, um, but I can tell you that obviously because we are participants with the task force that we would be open to, to any ideas. And, you know, I'm glad you have to thank Darren for that list because Darren's the one who put that all together for me um, at the last minute. So, it, but it really does show, and I'm glad it's recognized that it does show that we are willing to go in and, and help. It's just, I think a matter of us really honing in on the specific issues that we need to tackle legislatively and the specific issues that can be tackled through education. And y'all, I have to say this, I forgot to say it out loud. Um, you know, I thought at the last meeting, you know, Ms. Starr really made an impact when she said education. I thought that was incredibly, I know she's not on today's call, but it was pretty reflective and of her to recognize that, you know, going forward, that, that that's a key component. Um, and it really got me thinking about where we can go and what we can do. And just real quick, I know Katie, I think you asked about the 1200. That was the um, the firearms transfer law back in 2018. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to reflect it in the notes because I know you'll send the, the PowerPoint that I can send out to all the members, but wanted to reflect. Yeah, my, my keyboard is on the other side, so I can't type back, but I saw the question. So I just wanted to say that out loud. Um, I just wanted to read from the chat. Um, Mariah said, I wonder if a recommendation could be made to develop a set of guidelines or best practice recommendations for prosecutorial review of these types of cases, what things to consider since each case is unique but common factors could be looked at. No, thanks, thanks, Mariah. I'm happy to read out loud if that's easier. Yeah, and I was thinking something along those lines too, even if it was a report that said, not necessarily a summary, but how many times each di district attorney's office utilized or like request they receive for that particular provision of um, relief versus how many granted, I think would be helpful because then for people who want to utilize it, yeah, they may have to do, to do the work to like, whether it's certain information or trying to dig, you know, to see which cases those were, but at least to know where it's being requested and um, how many are actually being granted. Because the other thing is that if it's never going to be granted, right? Like if there's never, if there's never any indication, I think for attorneys or for people, especially I'm thinking like the women's uh, project at Tulane, like where they're having maybe, res you know, they're trying to figure out where the best place to utilize resources are in terms of helping get relief for certain um people under these circumstances, it may be that that's not actually a way to go, you know? So I just feel like more information is always helpful, you know, in that sense. That's more easy to ac access rather than doing public record requests for each uh, district attorney's office in the state. Cause that, you know, that becomes, a harder process, I guess.
I don't know if you have any thoughts on whether the DA's association may consider that. I, I know you said that, you know, be open-minded to all, but I, um, I, my experience with the uh, material arrest warrant issue that we um, did, they did agree to a report at the end. So that's where I'm thinking, you know, just a report that reports how many times it was utilized or, you know what I mean? Like maybe something y'all could come to an agreement on. And just my thoughts. I mean, I think it would be, it would be dependent upon how that's written. Um, separate and aside from that also is that, you know, we, we definitely rely a lot. I know you just mentioned public records um, because we also can't give information away where a, a case is open or pending or decisions are open and pending on cases. So any data that could potentially be collected would be historical data. And I think because the law is so new, even a public records request issued right now, even if say it issued to every DA's office, um, one, it depends upon the information, how the information is tracked, because hey, I'll take us back to public records because I deal with that in my capacity as the executive ADA here, is that it has to be readily, you know, records that are kept in the regular course of business. Um, and so I, I think a base level, especially given how new this law is, would be to start with maybe a recommendation for that. But any, I, even if we issued or if public records went out across the state, this statute is so new that, and the data collection is different, that I think it would be almost a fruitless effort to, to start tackling it now. Well, and I think um, I'm at that point now with dealing with the legislature where I'm like, okay, we could send out, we could ask for an HR that's a recommendation, but until we mandate it, nobody's going to actually collect it. So it may just be trying to somehow do our own little education thing about how it would be important to collect it now. And then in a couple of years or whatever, say, okay, well, now that you know about the law, please, like, yeah, we're going to ask or mandate, you know, for a mandate for it. I know nobody, nobody apparently likes mandates in this state for anything, but sometimes they have to happen in order for things to get done, I find. Any, anyone else? Any other questions? No, it looks it looks like um, I think at least at this point, um, no more questions. I don't know if anyone. Stas, uh, do you have a question? Yeah, I, I, did, I had one question. I guess I'm wondering. <clears throat> so uh, we have nine thirty point ten now, which um, allows district attorney's office to review review cases on a case by case basis and decide whether they'd be willing to agree to post conviction plea agreements or to vacate convictions. Um, I'm wondering if you think there's any mechanism outside of that. Um, so other than, other than a mechanism that requires the agreement of all parties for survivors who have been incarcerated for a really long time and, have, and are beyond their typical post-conviction time limits to seek judicial review. Like if you think there's any, any sort of legislative mechanism that could be used to, to um, give those folks a chance to come into court and present some of the evidence that never was never presented the first time around. Sorry, I muted myself, y'all. Oh, that's okay. Um, yes, <laughs> I can tell you that I, there are. Um, there is, a, a, as far as relief with a lower court, no, but there's always the relief of clemency. Oh yeah, I don't mean I don't mean currently. I mean, do you think that in terms of um, you know solutions in the future, um, would you have any uh, I guess legislation that you think would make sense as a mechanism for folks to be able to come into court? Because you know clem clemency is more about expressing remorse and rehabilitation and less um, explaining that someone should never be convicted in the first place. But do you think there's like a there be a mechanism, there should be a mechanism, there's a way to create a mechanism for 
um, folks to be able to come into the district court level and seek review and argue they had a wrongful conviction based on a lack of understanding of um, the role of intimate partner violence in the case. <clears throat> Well, and I would have to say, I don't want to pu or even input my opinion um, into that, you know, because I, I represent the LDAA right. and we come together with, with a lot of opinions and, you know, different, different areas of the state. After Val and I traveled, or Lieutenant Martinez Jordan and I traveled around the state, I learned that we are an incredibly diverse population. Um, I don't know if North Louisiana knows what gumbo is, but that's okay. <laughs> for, I mean, from up north. Um, <laughs> so I, I would be, I mean, I, it would be irresponsible, irresponsible of me to even I, be able to speculate on that. I think as what I can tell you is as, you know, laws are written, all of that, we always take a look at it um, and decide to best assess with the legal mechanisms we have. I mean, 930.10 is, is pretty brand new. And so we are waiting to see, you know, what comes of that. Um, and I think it would be premature to even start down that road without assessing the, the 930.10 and to see if it, it is working because 930.10 did give us the vehicle to legitimize what a lot of DA's offices were already doing. And just, you know, it's almost like now 930.10, if you wanna to drive to Houston, you take I-10. Before that, you had to go through, you know, Arkansas to get there. So it's just different. And I would be, again, irresponsible to speak or give an opinion on that. Any any other questions? Well, again, Sunny, thank you so much um, for your presentation. I really appreciate it, um, putting that together and um, giving us obviously a lot to discuss um, and um, to think about in terms of sort of the next uh, steps for the task force. So I think at this point, uh, I did want to, although I know we've had participation from members of the public, just in case there was anyone in the members of the public who is not a member of the task force, would like to make a comment or ask a question. This is a designated time right now to do that. So if there are task uh, non-task force members that would like to um, make a comment or ask a question, please. Um, unmute your microphone and, okay. I am not seeing that happen. This is, oh yeah, this go is ahead. Mary Patricia, sorry, took yeah. me a moment to get unmuted. I just oh, want to sorry. say um, um, uh, thank you for all this great information. Um, I, I do a lot of uh, government relations work at the Capitol, including on these topics. And I, I really just wanted to unmute myself to kind of second what um, Morgan said earlier, which is, you know, um, we, we've, we study and we study, and then what happens is term limits give us a new group of legislators, and then they want to study what's already been studied. And I would just be a big proponent of making um, the recommendations of this task force, the recommendations, and then the statutes, the actual final product. Um, because otherwise I think we're going to uh, enter another term with a bunch of new legislators and be right where we are now on much of what is being discussed. So that, that's just my one person's opinion humbly offered um, from a government relations standpoint. And I would just offer to any of you that do have relationships with people that I think, you know, sometimes perceive what we might want to work on as, um, you know, against their interests, including the District Attorneys Association, um, where we have lots of, of friends and assistance and also, you know, friction, anything that we can do to um, assure them that this has been studied um, and has been examined and, and that these recommendations are um, valid and good and legitimate, we are all ears to try to um, bring this advocacy on some of these uh, positions, you know, more, more in line with with mandates rather than suggestions. So um, that's just my two cents as a member of the public that's observing and kind of watching what, what we may come up with as a task force here and hoping to 
uh, convince some legislators of whatever this task force recommends at the end of the process. So I appreciate all of you so much and all the time and expertise you've put into this. Thank you, Mary Patricia. Thank you. I think that's a, a good point. And I, I realize I also went off script um, and I put one thing before the other. So I, I actually want to return to item five on our agenda for today, which is the discussion, a discussion of what we should be putting in the report. And I think MP just gave us a, a sort of some guide there. Um, would and one of the things that just to make sure folks understand what we'll be doing is coming up with sort of a draft that it will be circulating um, for further discussion and comments, largely through email before the final report for the task force is generated. Um, but this is an opportunity for folks to sort of share thoughts that they might have on, on what specific, um, specifically we would might wanna put into that report from the things in the testimony we've heard and um, the comments and discussions we've had. So if anyone wants to share some thoughts on that. I do know that, that you know, Katie has been taking obviously very detailed notes um, about what we've heard and suggestions that have come up through discussion and previous speakers as well, of course, as today with Sunny. Um, and so those are things from which we'll pull to sort of put into the draft task uh, force recommendation. Um, but again, um, I invite anyone to sort of make any suggestions that they've been thinking about or considering, including members of the public are welcome to, to do that as well. Yeah, and we, um, like Catherine said, you know, a draft report based on everything that we've discussed and heard and, and done in this task force will be circulated. Um, it needs to be submitted to the legislature by January 15th. So um, we'll have to have a, a short meeting early next year to approve the report, um, but folks will have time to take a look at it. Um, yeah, I guess I'm ref like, I'm reflecting in the on how many different um, areas, uh, you know, areas of the system touch the lives of of um, victim defendants and um, of IPV survivors, and um, it I think it has been really wonderful to have so many different areas of expertise on this task force, from law enforcement to advocates to directly impacted people and and all around, and so. Um, we'll do our best to pull together uh, everything that we've been working on over the past four months into just just one report that hopefully won't be too long. Um, right. another It'll actually get read, huh? <laughs> one of the things too is just to, I mean, I hope this is obvious, but anyone who has recommendations that they want to share uh, that occur to them later, please feel free to, to email Katie, myself, um, and my co-chair Leslie Chambers as well. Um, and we will certainly um, always be sort of integrating things into the final report sort of as a work in progress. So please feel free to reach out to us in that way also. I do have a recommendation though, Katie, even though I, it's like my first meeting, which I didn't get to ever introduce myself, Morgan Lamondre from STAR. Um, it's now, not your first rodeo, though. It's your first <laughs> meeting here, but certainly not your first rodeo. Thank so. you for clarifying that for me. But um, I, I think this task force is only for a year. Um, if you do come up with any recommendations or if any policies come out of this that um, are more requests, not mandates, my suggestion would be to come up with what would then be a review panel to make sure those policies are actually happening because whether it's feel good legislation or just you know okay we want this to happen what i've noticed in sexual assault victim policy world is we'll say you have to do a lot of these things and then a couple years later it's like oh nobody's doing these things and so coming up with a review panel or some sort of continuation of the task force that you're able to actually there there needs to be a space to kind of see what 
what is actually happening. If there are any recommendations that are either picked up or if there's no recommendations that are picked up, there needs to be a way to continue the, the discussion. And I don't know if that, usually the task force language is for like, you know, things that are gonna be studied for a year. I think the review panel um, language is usually something that happens a little bit more permanently or continuous. So just that's a thought. I don't know how you put that in somewhere, but I do think a recommendation definitely needs to be that there, there's a continuation of this discussion. That's very interesting. Thank you, Morgan, for sharing that. Anything, anything else? Sorry. I'm, I told Katie, no, I'm so sorry, I'm always talking. Um, and this may actually be a question for you about sort of data that's available, because one of the things we tend to struggle with in Louisiana is data. Is there some sort of way to, and I, I can't, I know you all had meetings and I, which I, I want to give a public kudos to Katie because I told her of all the task force I've ever been appointed, in, I was easily able to catch up for the most part because of all of her notes, all of the recordings. And I just, she's the most organized person in the world. So yes. I just want to give her like a snaps and shout out for that. So thank you so much, Katie. But um, I know you all had some presentations from DOC about sort of them knowing when there is somebody who's incarcerated, who has sort of the background in terms of victim victim defendant, but it wasn't clear to me if there's an easy way to get that data. No, the, the answer was they even said no, right? Okay. They, they, they basically it's right, yeah. And I think if there's some way that, and I know there's probably somebody here from DOC or appointed from DOC. Yeah, usually we somewhere, I, no, I think we lost, Francis, is Francis on here? No. But, and I don't know how, what the answer is or how it can be done. Cause I know once again, it's always about resources, but whether it's also starting, right? Like it may be hard to go back, but moving forward, starting January, you know, whatever date you put in to where kind of like Priya requires an assessment of each prisoner to determine whether or not, you know, there's like the uh, assessment for, for Prison Rape Elimination Act about, you know, um, risk for sexual assault, maybe there can be some sort of screening part of that, that you assess whether or not somebody's incarcerated related to intimate partner violence. So we can, it's so hard to do anything without the data. We need right. easy, we need the data. And so that would be another question or I, suggestion. I, right. And I think I think clearly yeah, that is something that was we did have some discussions about that. And, and I totally agree with you, Morgan. Data is, is critical for learning how to go forward and learning out the scope of the problem. I know that one of the things that was discussed is how challenging it is to get that kind of data because particularly I think when someone first enters the DOC. Um, you know, one of the big problems, of course, and, and I've certainly seen this with our clients is, is often people don't even self-identify. Right. Uh, and so I, I, you know, there's always a concern about actually catching data that's inaccurate and mm -hmm. that under reports. And, and so um, I think that, you know, that can actually be in some ways could even be worse. Right. Uh, right. Well, and I think that's why maybe kind of like the Prison Rape Elimination Act, it's not just like those straightforward, have you ever raped somebody? It's like, have you ever forced anybody to have sex? Like, you know, those those subtle questions that people will answer, right? Like, has anybody ever withheld money from you? You know, like something along those lines, but yeah, that would take some time. And But there's just gotta be a better way for there to be data. I mean, like, do we even right. know who's in our prisons? Like, I'm like, I don't even know if we know. So. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you had a chance to watch some of the earlier video. Uh, we did have one uh, again with, with um, some folks from DOC. Um, and then also Professor Marcus Concar talked about some of the statistics related to who we have in 
Louisiana, but also I think more broadly, um, which of course we can extrapolate some degree uh, into Louisiana, but absolutely agree with you. Obviously we need data when we can find it and hopefully accurate data. So I, I think I do think some of that discussion will go back through our notes and figure out what, what we might be able to piece together. Anyone else on suggestions? And by the way, Morgan, thank you for chiming in. <laughs> um, any, any other sort of points or suggestions or thoughts about what we might want to include? Well, again, I encourage anyone to, uh, who has some thoughts later on, if you're anything like me, they occur to you at random times through the day and night. And so if that happens, please just um, shoot us an email um, and so that we can make sure that if it hasn't been in our notes before that we will um, have it there to uh, consider for our draft. Um, and with that, since I'm not seeing any um, anyone's hands raised. Uh, we have had a call for public testimony. I renew it again briefly, if anyone wants to chime in. Um, and I don't know, Katie, we have other business uh, listed as number seven on our agenda. Is there any specific other business other than setting a date, which we'll, I think we'll probably wanna do by email. We can do it by email. I just took a quick look at the calendar and it seems like, um, you know, just keeping the same time for our last meeting might be the best bet. So that would be to meet the deadline January 11th, um, Tuesday, January 11th. I'm not sure I'm going to be available, but. Um, okay, we can definitely figure it out. Right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's we do can. that then. All right, super. And then, so if, if there's no one else um, who wanted to make a comment or add anything to the other business agenda item, then I believe uh, I will adjourn this meeting. And thank you all. I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday. Um, stay safe and healthy, um, obviously. And um, be look on your lookout in your email box for um, some draft language for the task force report. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, did you need a motion to adjourn? Oh, gosh. Sure. Give us an motion to adjourn. We'll do this. <laughs> Robert's rules. Robert's rules. Yeah, go. Motion. <laughs> My love is second. All right, we got a second from Sunny. Perfect. Thank you, Morgan. Bye.